Hi, I'm Max Blumenthal for The Real News. We're in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club for an event on the Israel lobby. And I'm here with Ilan Pape, um, Israeli revisionist scholar, I guess we could call you that. Um, and you're coming out with two new books. And I just got a galley of your latest, which is called The Ten, it's the Ten Myths of Israel. That's right. Um, so what is the biggest myth about Israel? Would it be, um, you know, a land for a people, for a people without a land. Uh, Israel is um, the only democracy in the Middle mm. East. I mean, what, what do you think the biggest myth is? I think it's very difficult to choose, and that's why you I didn't have it like a top ten list. I didn't like, have. I I, I chose uh, chronology as okay. the main uh, regulator for the uh, for the myth. So I began with the land without people and people without land. But I really think that the biggest myth. Uh, of all it has to do with how each of this myth does not allow uh, us to understand the real nature of Zionism and the project of Zionism and the nature of Israel today. Yeah, I think uh, when you listen to Netanyahu and he's sort of this master of expounding on this myth that Israel's not only not a settler colonial state, but that it's sort of a normal democracy that has flowered out of the Middle East almost organically because of the Jewish ancestral connection. Um, and then when he talks about the conflict, or I wouldn't even call it a conflict, I'd call it a crisis, he always goes back to the Hebron riots. He goes back to these events that um, occurred before the state of Israel was founded, for example, um, attacks on Jewish communities in Yaffa, and never explains how those communities came there and what the real story was. Um, so how do you challenge Netanyahu's narrative right. of um, Jewish-Arab relations in historic Palestine? It's, I think it's deeper than that. And Netanyahu, in this uh, respect, represents a very a, a deep uh, uh, in, uh, Israeli Jewish conviction that they are the indigenous people of Palestine and the Palestinians are the settlers. Yeah. They are the aliens. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and this is the starting point. The starting point is we are the indigenous Yes, we, have, we haven't been there for a few hundreds of maybe 2,000 years, but we are the indigenous people of Palestine. And from there, everything else emanates. Yeah. Uh, and I think the way to challenge it is, is really by using this paradigm of settler colonialism, because it was, it's not exceptional for a settler colonial movement to claim to be the indigenous people of the place that they occupy, colonize, and quite often genocide. It happened before uh, in other places. And I think that's something that uh, allows people who either were victims of other settler colonial projects or people who are part of settler colonial states like the United States, right. but are very familiar nowadays with their own history right. and understand their own origins to, to understand that actually it's not exceptional it's not an exception. The only exceptional part of it is the denial, yeah. not the very historical act itself. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these myths are actually just Hasbara arguments by, uh, in many cases, morons for the consumption of morons. But I found that in our world, there are a lot. Of, I mean, it falls on fertile soil. I mean, the education system isn't very good in the West. Um, so you have these um, Netanyahu, and I think, you know, this is kind of a common feature of Hasbara, trying to draw a distinction between settler colonialism and traditional metropole colonialism. And you'll hear him say, you know, we're not, we're not the uh, French colonizing Algeria. We have nowhere to go back to. You know, this is our homeland, and we can't go back anywhere. Um, you know, what, what, how, do you, how do you respond yeah. to that? And, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that we... Um, we've failed to do is explain how settler colonialism is in many ways more pernicious than traditional colonialism. Absolutely. The exceptional part of the story is that settler colonialism made certain connections or made certain assumptions which were accepted in the 19th century but looked ridiculous, inhuman, and non-democratic in the 20th century. And yet, in the particular case of Israel, they still remain valid. For instance, the claim that the only way you can create a democracy in a country which has settlers and natives is if the settlers are always the majority, 
which is the argument of the liberal Zionists, not the, uh, not the right-wing Zionists. The liberal Zionists, the whole peace process is based on the idea that the only way democracy can be sustained in Palestine is if the Jews are a majority in their own homeland. Right. So this is a ridiculous assumption that in any other uh, context would be rejected as racist. But in the case of Israel, is accepted. Right. And, and I think that that's where the interesting part of the analysis comes into, I think, in, also in my book, in the 10 minutes, why educated, well-read people in the West did not see this? Or did they see it and decided to accept it for reasons of guilt, uh, anti-Semitism, because they didn't want the Jews to, to stay in Europe? God knows why. Everyone had their own reasons for that. For the second uh, uh, point that you, you were making, I think that it's very important to highlight when you talk about any settler colonial project, what Patrick Wolf called the logic of the elimination of the native. That you cannot create a new settler colonial society or a settler nation state uh, from the settler colonial perspective as long as there is an indigenous native population there. So you have to get rid of them. You genocide. Genocide them as you did in America or impose apartheid and Bantu on them as you did in South Africa or ethnically cleanse them as you did in Palestine. The means vary from one historical yeah. case study to the other. The logic is the same logic. And what is amazing is that this logic is still legitimized in the 21st century in the case of Israel under the guise of slogans such as the only uh, democracy in the Middle East, uh, a, a country that wants peace but doesn't find the right partner for it, and all the other mythologies that are connected to the peace process. Yeah, I think that the logic of the underlying logic of Zionism, uh, of maintaining a demographic majority, a sort of ethnic overclass through um, you know violent dem uh, demographic social engineering, is scarcely ever interrogated in our mainstream media. Um, in academia, it's even very rare to see it. Um, would you say that that has fueled the um, rhetoric and the politics of the far right in, in, West, in Western Europe and in the United States, where you hear someone like Stephen Bannon, who's the chief counselor to Donald Trump, the main intellectual force behind him, say um, at a major conference in Washington that the United States is not just an economy, it has to represent a culture. Um, we, we have wide and sometimes divergent opinions, but I think we, the center core of what we believe, that we're a nation with an economy, not an economy just in some global marketplace with open borders, but we are a nation with a, a culture and a, uh, and a reason for being. And it's this culturalist narrative, um, which implies that the United States is white and Christian and it must maintain a white Christian demographic majority. Um, do you think that that has anything to do with the legitimization uh, that Israel's experienced? I, um, I do think so. I think if you are a member of a right-wing intellectual movement or ideological movement or political movement, you watch Israel desperately in a way. You yes. say, my ideas, my assumptions, my discourse that is regarded as fringe, lunatic, and dangerous is welcomed when it is uh, uttered by the uh, spokespersons for the Israeli Jewish state or by Israel itself. It's exactly that. Uh, the dehumanization that Israel is allowed to express through its discourse, through its policies, through its activities is not different from any racist uh, uh, approach by any other group. In fact, settler colonialism is one of the most uh, dangerous forms of modern racism. Uh, and and uh, it's not surprising that the two ways in which Israel was trying to challenge this or, or protect this kind of exceptionalism, yeah. because it's very precarious. It can, it can, you know, one day the truth can be <laughs> discovered and people would say, wait a minute, you're not different from an extreme right movement in America. You are, you are the same, especially when the right wing in Israel becomes stronger. So there are two ways that trying to challenge it. One is by claiming that, oh, we, we don't use violent means, if you're a liberal Zionist, we're not looking for violent means of keeping uh, demographic purity. We're actually willing to give up some territory in order to keep demographic purity, or we enclave, we incarcerate, right. we besiege the Palestinians in small Bantustan so that we will 
demo, we demographically pure. In Israel, it's liberals saying build the wall. Absolutely, absolutely and liberal. Then, of course, because it, this means I don't want to use supposedly violent means. I'm right. not expelling people. We're not going to transfer anyone. Exactly. We're just not going to let them leave. We're just going to say, the, what was, uh, it was Ehud Barak's uh, campaign slogan. Yeah, we are here and they are Us over there. here, them over there. And exactly. we would recognize that here as sort of segregation. Exactly. But it's hard segregation. Absolutely. And the second means, and the second means by which they, they, they try to, to sort of hide it is, is the one that Netanyahu prefers, because he cannot say that he's uh, willing to, uh, to give up territory. And this is uh, elevating this idea of, of un- elevating anti-Semitism into supposedly a new phenomenon, right, and the, the new, new anti-Semitism. Uh, and, and to say that uh, uh, when you criticize Israeli settler colonialism, you're not criticizing racism, but you're actually racist yourself. Yeah. Uh, like the indigenous issue. Uh, if uh, if you the Palestinians claim that they are indigenous, we will claim that we are the indigenous and right. they are the settlers. Right. It's this really uh, a new speak, which world. actually embraces the true logic of anti-Semitism that conflates Zionism with Jews and holds them responsible collectively for all of Zionism's crimes. Absolutely, absolutely, it's above another layer of uniformity or connection between the idea that. Jews should be settler colonialists in Asia or the Arab world and not live as communities in the West, which is another kind of joint uh, uh, platform for anti-Semitism and Zionism. Right, which opens the door for this kind of um, alliance of convenience we've seen with parties like the National Front in France. Uh, The Jobbik party even in Hungary is moving away from its um, traditional anti-Semitism into a more pro-Zionist. We see the Austrian Freedom Party. um, Strasse was hosted by the Likud party. This is a party founded by Nazis in Austria. He was hosted for a visit of the Holocaust Museum by the Likud party. Um, You go across the board to all these far-right parties down to Trump and the Republican Party, and they've all become pro-Israel. Well, holding on to this um, idea that, you know, Jews really belong somewhere yeah. else. And, and this is the whole notion of the Palestinians as immigrants. You have immigrants in Holland, yeah. uh, and you have all the right to vote for a right-wing party because they are really Muslim immigrants, and they create all the problem. We also have Muslim immigrants in Israel, and they're using the same methods right. to identify themselves, to... to uh, uh, to, to operate uh, politically and violently against our own culture, our own set of values. Right. We it's understand kind of, the terrorism that absolutely. you're experiencing. We have it ourselves. And there are very worrying uh, uh, connections nowadays between the Israeli strategic advisors and experts uh, and their counterparts in France, Britain, Holland, Denmark. They advise them how to control immigrant societies in order to preempt the next uh, loner, you know, the next, the next uh, lone wolf. Lone, right? lone and wolf. it's uh, what, through biometrics and racial profiling and what do they call it, uh, micro, micro expressions? Micro expressions. And it's all built on this assumption. We all have Muslim migrant societies that did not fit in to the host culture. Right. And uh, that, that that's quite a, a challenge for us to it's so false. It's almost like uh, the kind of Nazi propaganda that you have such a big lie that the, the, the bigger the lie is, the, the more difficult it is than to diffuse it. it it's such a big lie that uh, I think we are, at the beginning, we're a bit paralyzed when we try to challenge it because it's, it's so false. And yet, I think we have to be patient and unpack it again for the audiences and make sure that people understand how ridiculous and dangerous it is for both case studies. Elon Pape, thanks a lot. Thank you. I'm Max Blumenthal in Washington, D.C. for The Real News.